but it, uh, with the Q and A, it's on PowerPoint only, and probably in time I'll change this over to notebook form as well, like I did Wednesday night. But for now, I'm going to keep going with it like it is until I can have time to to do that. But uh, certainly good to see all of you here. Here we are on the last Lord's Day of January. January, here in a few days, we'll be in the history books and won't be long, we'll say, where did 2024 go? That's just how it goes. We need to make the most out of every day. We're certainly uh, happy to see you here this morning. Um, we have those that we want to remember in prayer. We want to continue to remember Philip Hammond and his family. Uh, we had the funeral for his youngest sister, Lorianne McElroy, uh, yesterday in Georgia, northwest Georgia, at her funeral yesterday morning. Also, we want to remember the family of uh, Margaret White. Uh, Margaret, longtime member here at Wood Avenue, and uh, she passed on uh, Friday evening, Friday afternoon, about 5.30, and uh, arrangements have not been made as of yet. Uh, once they're made, we will uh, get this information to you, but uh, we certainly want to uh, keep Margaret's children in our prayers. Uh, Alice and Teresa and all of her grandchildren. We want to keep them uh, in our prayers. Margaret was a sweet lady, 94 years old, uh, just always a joy to be around. Came here as long as she could up until just a couple of years ago. And then she got to where she was no longer able to do so. Other, other prayer requests that we have this morning? Uh, Sister Wheatman uh, mentioned a best close friend of the family, of one of their best friends, uh, uh, who's in her wedding, 84 years old, fell and had a uh, brain bleed, um, not doing well. So certainly we want to remember him in our prayers. Uh, he lives in South Florida. What, what was the name? Giles Tompkins. Giles? Giles Tompkins. Okay. okay. February the 9th, back Dale's daughter having back surgery on February the 9th, coming up soon. Well, certainly we want to remember you in our prayers and those who will be tending to you, absolutely. And tell me, and, and? Andrea. Andrea, okay. We have a new student. What is your name? <laughs> right up front. You see, he's sitting in front of his in laws to look like a good guy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're in David's seat. We'll see what happens in a minute. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one, Rick. All right, any other prayer requests? <laughs> yes, Charles. Absolutely. People in Ukraine. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. Naomi's had the flu. She's, she's a little better getting over it, but not here today. I did not know that. Hear that. Anybody else? Okay, let's, let's pray. Our God and Holy Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day and your blessings. And we're thankful, Father, for life that you give us. And Father, we, we know as, as we announce uh, each week a uh, specific request that we come before your throne mercy and with petitions we know that uh, in this life uh, there there are the ups and downs there's the uh, the, the the health and uh, that uh, sometimes we we desire and sometimes not but father we know that in all things you are in control and we pray all things according to your will and leave all things within your hands father we help us to uh, always uh, focus on that which is in our complete control because you offer it to us, and that is our salvation. May we always keep our focus upon you, our faith strong. May we always glorify you daily. 
throughout this life until we can uh, go to heaven. Father, we pray that you be with the Hammond and uh, White families. Uh, bless them. And we know it's always difficult when a loved one <clears throat> leaves this, this world. And we ask your richest blessings to be upon them, be upon uh, Margaret's daughters, Alice and Teresa, as they uh, plan uh, her funeral, her memorial. And, and pray that uh, they can find comfort through your word uh, in the life that she lived. Father, we uh, pray uh, for the one that has fallen recently, Sister Wheatman's friend. We ask your blessings to be upon him and his health at this time. And pray that he'll be faithful and throughout this and they'll do the very best for him. Father, we pray for our sister Andrea and her upcoming surgery. All the, we pray that all will go well with her and her body will be strong for it and healthy for it. Please be with the surgeons and all who are caring for her between now and then and during recovery. Pray that each one will do the, the very best in, in preparation for this surgery and during this surgery. We can give you we continue to give you thanks for Sister Evan Evans uh, successful surgery. We ask your blessings to be upon her now and, and and her recovery. Please be with our good sister Naomi. Pray that she will uh, recover fully uh, soon if your will and uh, pray your blessings to be upon her at this time. Continue to pray, Father, for those in Ukraine. Continue to pray for those who are seeking truth. May we do all we can to help them to seek truth. Father, we know that not just in Ukraine, but throughout the world, there's, there's much evil, much heartache, much horror. Pray that there could be peace throughout these lands and here in the States as well. Help us as we study together. May we glorify you in all that we do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are... Uh, wrapping up the life of King Saul today, 1 Samuel chapter 31. And again, this is the final slide if you still have your handout. Uh, but we will spend additional time with three questions that, uh, that have been submitted. And we will look at those uh, as well today. But uh, just as, you know, we did not have class last week. We had uh, worship only uh, with that of... Um, the weather and the road conditions the way they were. So it's been two weeks since we were last here. But uh, we, we've been looking at the life of Saul. We looked at uh, his life alone for a while. Uh, and that from the beginning, his humble beginnings in the first couple of chapters about Saul, he was doing great things. You couldn't ask for anything more from what this guy was doing. He was, he was obeying the Lord. He was faithful in what he was doing. He was making godly decisions. But uh, then that changes. And one decision, ungodly decision, led to the next and the next and the next. And it is like this with many people in the Bible. But Saul is certainly a case to remember of you a completely different person from the beginning of his life to the end of his life. And then we started noticing the transition, bringing in his son Jonathan, as well as David, the next anointed king. David is not yet the king, but uh, he has been anointed by Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, so he's the next man up. Saul realizes that the kingdom will be stripped from him and his family, his offspring, Dan, uh, Jonathan. And uh, he does not want it to be this way. So all of that is kind of your transition period going into David. So we're ready now to begin uh, a tragic end to a once godly man. First Samuel chapter 31 is where we're ready to begin. And remember that... Uh, in the beginning, when we first started studying the kings of Israel, I mentioned you know those those six double books of the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel, uh, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. Uh, they they work together, just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's it's good to put these six books together to get the complete picture of what is going on. And again, we have in our library here in the church office uh, a harmony of uh, Samuel. Kings and Chronicles, if you ever want to use that to aid your study. But you'll notice we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 31, as well as 1 Chronicles chapter 10, uh, because they both carry the account of Saul and Jonathan dying on the battlefield. But Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 10, gives us a little extra information that Samuel does not give us in the, in the book of 1 Samuel. So a little extra information that Samuel does not give us. Um, and so uh, it's always good to, uh, to notice what is going on. So Saul, by this point in life, 
Remember, God has completely left his presence. Uh, he, he will not answer him. Uh, Samuel is dead. That's where Saul goes to the medium that we talked about two weeks ago. Uh, so Saul is, because of his own decisions, he's on his own now. He's on his own. He's all, and, and everything bad is happening. Remember uh, one more thing in chapter 28, verses 3 through 19. That's where, to the surprise of everyone, the medium, namely, uh, Samuel is brought back from the dead. And he said, why are you disturbing me to Saul? He's angry with Saul. But do you remember what he said to Saul? Does anyone remember what he said to Saul? You and your sons... Tomorrow, you'll be with me. So from chapter 28 to 31, you're a day, 24 hours, uh, as far as the events that's recorded. Samuel, who is dead, I'm going to get their names mixed up, Samuel, so I'm going to say it wrong. So just excuse me and, uh, when I do. But Samuel, who is dead, says to Saul, who is living, this time tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. And that's what happens in chapter 31. All right, 1 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 31. I'm going to go ahead and read the chapter. It is only, what, uh, 13 verses long, uh, long. So let's read the chapter. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain at Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And we see that the uh, Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchusa, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, verse 4, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. Remember, all of Saul's kingdom, he's dealing with the Philistines. From, from Goliath forward and even before that. In verse 4, but his armor bearer would not, for he was already afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. As far as I know, there are four accounts of suicide in the Bible. Here are two. One would be uh, Samson when he pulls down the walls the, the, with the Philistines. The other, of course, would be Judas, Matthew 27, when he goes out and, and hangs himself. And it's not a happy subject, I know, but I do believe there are, these are the four times that the Bible uh, mentions it. In verse 6, so Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word, word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple uh, uh, of the Ashtoreths, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Verse 11 is going to be key. We're going to talk about this in a moment. Now, when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there, kind of a custom at that time. Then they took their bones and buried them under the Teramisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. You remember David did the same thing back in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when he defeated Goliath. He took his head off. And um, so here you see the end of the life of Saul and Jonathan uh, and the other sons just the same. Again, a tragic end to a once godly man. You remember back in uh, chapter 8, it was the people of Israel who demanded a king. And God said, let them have their king, but I'm going to choose him. And he chose Saul, uh, a man of humble beginnings, a man who wanted to honor his father and uh, who knew his father would be worried about him. A man who did not repay evil for evil. When they said, let's go kill these rebels who were against you being a king. He said, no, we're not going to do that. He established his kingdom the right way. 
But one bad decision leads to the next and the next and the next. And now you have this tragic end uh, in his life. Just a couple of thoughts before we go into 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Saul's bad decisions caused his children to suffer also. I need to think about that. The decisions that he made, it also caused his children to suffer uh, just the same. Years ago, I was on a board of directors for a, a camp, for a youth camp, and we were kind of having a little round table discussion. It was during major changes to the camp and disagreements about which direction we wanted to go. And I'll never forget, um, each person was allowed like three or four minutes to say something before we get got to our meeting. And one guy, he simply said, let's not make decisions today that will uh, hurt our children in the future. And that's all he said. Every other preacher took his time then some, right? Because we like to talk. Or every other board member. But that's the only thing I remember from what people said during that round table. Let's not make decisions today that will cause our children to suffer in the future. Saul made decisions that caused his children to suffer. Notice verse 11. The people of Jabez Gilead remembered the goodness of Saul and what he did for them. You remember back in chapter 11. When Saul is first proclaimed king, 1 Samuel chapter 11, when he is first proclaimed king, you're still in that period where he's not really, he's been anointed, he's been proclaimed, but he's not even actually had his official uh, time to be brought before the others. But there's this issue and the people of Jabez Gilead uh, were told, you know, if you cut out your eye, then you can serve us and we won't kill you. And they send for Saul and Saul goes and saves them, 1 Samuel chapter 11. I think that's interesting to remember that Saul saved them. And that's when, after the return from the, the battle and he was victorious, that's when they said, hey, let's kill all these rebels who were against you, chapter 10 and verse 27. Saul says, no, we're not going to do that. We're, we're, not, we're not going to do that at all. But isn't it interesting now here at the end, Israel's been defeated. The king has been killed. But these men are willing to risk their lives to go and get the bodies of Saul and his son. I believe it has something to do with chapter 11. And, and remembering what he did for them. That's, that's what I would take from that. Here was a man who went from uh, humble to prideful, from keeping his temper to losing his temper. How many times did we see him trying to kill David? He did kill the priest and those who worked with the priest. He went from sparing life to taking life. He went from trusting in God to searching for anyone and anything else that can help him. Even a medium. He was, and that's, that's where life goes when we leave God. We, we, when we, we start looking for any solution, any answer, and we're willing to do anything. Okay, go over now to 1 Chronicles chapter 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10, you notice it is 14 verses long. First Chronicles chapter 10, 14 verses long. And that would be after St. Samuel. It's easy to remember the double books of the Old Testament. You start at the end of the alphabet and you work forward. Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 10, the first 12 verses read pretty much the same as 1 Samuel chapter 31. Pretty much the same. But in Chronicles, we have two additional verses that gives us a little information that Samuel does not. Verse 13, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. A little bit of additional information in the book of First Chronicles that we do not have in 1 Samuel. It's interesting to me that um, these two verses do not say anything about what Saul did to other people. Do not say anything about what he did to Jonathan or David or the priest. It says what Saul did to sever his relationship with God. And when you sever your relationship with God, your actions towards other people are going to be different. When you're, when you're no longer godly, when you're no longer wanting to do uh, what is right according to God, then, then if your relationship with God is not right, 
then you're going to start doing this other stuff that we see Saul doing. And I think that's important for us to remember, even as Christians, when it comes to our salvation. Quite often, we want to teach people the rules, so to speak. This is what a Christian does. This is what a Christian doesn't do. While not focusing on the relationship with God. And we need to make sure we're focusing on the relationship with all people, uh, with our children, our grandchildren, with our new converts. Because if the relationship with God is there, if I love God and I want to obey God, then the the rules, they're a little easier to follow of what a Christian does and does not do. It's a little easier to get up and come to church on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock when I love God and I want to be here. But if I'm just told I have to be here, well, then it's going to be a little more challenging. I'm going to think of reasons to not come or to sleep in. You see, the relationship must be for everything else to follow. Saul, in these two verses, severed his relationship with God. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord. And also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he, and you know, this is something interesting to think about. God, if you go back and read the account of this back in 1 Samuel 28, Samuel's already dead. God has already removed himself from Saul. He's no longer speaking to him in in any miraculous way. But yet Saul is still condemned for taking this route. And that's something we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Saul could still turn it around and make the right decisions. Now, he's already to the point that he's suffering the consequences. That's true. But he's continuing to make bad decisions. Uh, But he did not inquire of the Lord. Again, the Lord had removed his presence from him. But you can see, again, this is something we talked about two weeks ago, the difference in being sorry, looking for a quick fix, and then truly repenting like David did in Psalm 51 and uh, trying to find your way back to the Lord. Okay, notice a couple of thoughts on the... uh, uh, Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 18. And that's where we were. That's where he consulted the medium. Actually, go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. 1 Samuel 28 is where he consulted the medium. But remember, it all goes back to the law. And in everything that you see, here's another lesson for us in New Testament Christianity. Quite often it's the case that people will say, well, that's old and that's outdated. No, it's not. And we must always go back to the book and uh, remember the power of in the word of God. You see throughout the rest of the history of the people of Israel, when any time that they were being punished or condemned, it went back to these books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It always went back to the law, regardless of how far removed they were from the time that it was given. It did not matter. They were still held accountable. Even in our Lord's day, they're still held accountable to the law. It's not mattered that all this time has passed. They still must do it. Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning in verse 14. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your Brethren, you shall set as a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Verse 16, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, and he shall greatly multiply silver, uh, nor shall he greatly multiply silver nor gold for himself. And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from one of the uh, before, uh, from, from the one before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of the law of these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Saul is the 
ultimate example of turning prideful and uh, going from humble beginnings to, to prideful. And you can see it goes back to he quit uh, serving the Lord. He quit using the law. He quit using the word of God. He quit depending on God. He started making his own decisions. And that's why you see what happened to him uh, and to his children in the end. It was no longer about God. And again, the same is true. And it can happen to all of us today. When we forsake the word of God, when we forsake the Bible, when we forsake study, then uh, we can get to the point where uh, we've completely forgotten God and what it means to be a Christian. James chapter 5, when he converts him back to the truth. It's possible to get to that point where you've completely forgotten what it means to be a Christian. In Leviticus chapter 19, uh, notice a, uh, a little more about the law. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 31. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 31. Uh, and throughout the law, you continue to read of what they were to do. And by the way, that that we just read in Deuteronomy 17, if you're taking notes, you might want to write, uh, write, jot down Joshua chapter 1. Now, Joshua was not a king of the people of Israel. In that sense, uh, they were not yet like an established kingdom. But he was a leader, of course. And he was the military leader and uh, he took over for Moses and he was a leader. Joshua, it's interesting to see the similarities. In Deuteronomy chapter 17 and Joshua chapter 1. Joshua was told the same thing. If you stay in this book, you do not turn right to the left, you meditate it in it day and night, then you'll be successful. And if not, you'll obviously, Joshua, of course, predated Saul. But in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 31, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. In chapter 20 and verse 6, And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits uh, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. So, here's the thing. You know, you read 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, you think, that's pretty harsh. I'll go back and read it all. All of this was warned by God from the beginning. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And the same is true today. God has given us his word and he expects us to follow it. He'll help us. He'll pick us up when we fall. But when we choose to be like Saul and completely abandon him, Romans 1, he'll let us go. He'll let us go. And we need that. That's what I'm choosing to learn from the life of Saul. That's what I'm choosing to, to think about and keep with me is don't leave God. I thought, thoughts or comments on the end of. Saul's life. I certainly appreciate J.D. sharing personal experiences with us and been with us Wood Avenue for a couple of years now. And, um, yeah, I mean, he could definitely tell us firsthand, I'm sure, of uh, the ups and downs of life and going back to much of how, how you're raised in childhood. And uh, it's challenging to overcome, but it can happen, you know. And since our brother, you know, brought it up, you know, he's one that even since he's been here, you've had your ups and downs. We're certainly thankful that he's back with us right now. We want to continue to encourage him to be back with us. Uh, it, it, it is. Once you, once you go down that road, it can, be, can turn it around, but it's hard, isn't it? It's, it's challenging to turn it around and, 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 and bring, it, bring it back, you know. And, and people, I mean, it will cause you to do things that are just unimaginable, you know. You know that, I mean, just... Just, you, you, you get to that point like Saul, you got to that point and he thinks there's no other way. So let me go find a, a medium. You saw the execution in the state of Alabama on Thursday that was directly tied to Sheffield. A point in time that that preacher probably never thought his life would get 
to this point. But yet, to hire a hit on his wife, what happens to get to that point in life? You know, that's what happens when you leave God. That's what happens when you leave God. Did I see another hand over here? Yeah. I was gonna point out. I thought when we started studying Saul that he was one that came in and immediately pushed all of the soothsayers and fortune tellers and mediums out. And I was trying to find that verse. Uh, chapter twenty-eight, I think. Chapter 28, 1 Samuel 28, it talks about Saul had rid, rid the land of them um, when he goes to meet the medium. Uh, and she even says, you know, he, got, he disguises himself to go to her because uh, Samuel died in verse 3. Uh, verse 3, Saul had put the mediums, the spiritists out of the land. And so Saul, uh, he, you know, the Philistines are gathered against him. God, verse 6, he inquired of the Lord. The Lord did not answer him. At this point, Saul is separated from the Lord, so the Lord's not answering him. So he tells his servants in verse 7, find me a woman who's a medium. He disguises himself in verse 8. The woman said to him in verse 9, look, you know that Saul, what he has done is cut off the medium. So yes, sir, is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Righteous decision early. Yes. You know, which you keep going back and forth about the extremes, and it makes me think like to ourselves that you never say never. Sure. You know, That's right. Paul talks about himself buffeting himself daily, lest he himself becomes a reprobate, because Paul knew it that I'm not above reproach, and I can just as quickly and, and as adamantly as I pronounce Christ, I can deny Christ. Sure. Peter's our example of that one. Saul and studying his life, he, he did this noble thing in the beginning and pushed them all out, wiped them all out to where this woman was even fearful, you know, and, and, and then to see the, the pig go back to the wallowing in the mire and the dog to his vomit. Yeah, that's a sobering vision, isn't it? First Peter chapter 2. You're exactly right. That, that, that's the thing. This guy's life, as much as anyone in the Bible, is completely different from beginning to end completely different from who he was uh, in, in the beginning. And it all goes back to Deuteronomy 17. He left the Lord. He did not continue to use the word of God to, to direct his life. And, uh, and, and that, that, is, that, is so, that is so true to just to see, uh, you know, how he, how he turned it around. And I was thinking about that, what you mentioned in 1 Corinthians 9, Moving into chapter 10, the Saul gives us, a, a Paul, I should say, who might be named after Saul, by the way. Remember, King Saul was from uh, Benjamin. Saul of Tarsus was from Benjamin. Likely that he was named after him. But, um, you know, he gives us that same warning. It, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with being confident, okay? There's, there's kind of the extremes. You have some saying, oh, I don't think I'm right. And I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm worried about my salvation. And then you have the other extreme of, well, there's nothing I could do to fall away from the church. And, and, and both are wrong, as extremes are. You know, we want to try to stay in that middle road. We want to be confident in our salvation. First John chapter 5 and verse 13 says we can be. We can know that we are saved by the things that are written. But again, there's, there's that happy medium of not being overconfident, realizing that if I'm going to remain saved, it's that daily humble walk with the Lord and never outrun the Lord, right? Never get in front of him, never go beyond him, but the confidence of walking in him. So, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see this to you, but there was some of the part of the COVID thing with the two wings I touched, and they said uh -huh. that, that was the narrow path that you got to walk. You know what I'm saying? Like, right before they touched, so it's... Sure. You definitely see a lot of similarities in symbolism from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And, uh, uh, and, and that's something that we're actually going to talk about this morning in our sermon. Um, we're finally going to get to our sanctuary sermon uh, this morning. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And, uh, but you're, you're right. It is a narrow path. It is, it is you know, it's, a, it's not impossible. But it, is by, it, it takes daily choice to stay on that path. Absolutely. And... Um, it's just that most choose not that direction. Let's notice. Um, oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. I'm not going to lead a song for you, that's for sure. You don't want that. <laughs> um, we have three questions that's been submitted. We'll not get to them all. I didn't expect us to get them to them all today. Um, so we'll look at these a little bit. Um, what was the distressing spirit from the Lord? First Samuel chapter 16. 
And is this similar to the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart? When that question was first asked, I thought, I don't, I'm not so sure that it is. Uh, but it, I think maybe it is, actually. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I think there's some similarities, at least. Spend a little more time with it. Looking at it. Uh, how did Saul not recognize David, even though they already met? After he defeats the Philistine. Uh, it seems as if maybe Saul does not recognize David, even though they already met. Uh, and then what was the relationship between David and Jonathan? Uh, I did not reverse it on this screen, I see. But really the, the text is actually 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 26. Where after Jonathan is dead and David is mourning over him, he says, Your love for me was greater than that of a woman. Some will use that to try to say that they were in a homosexual relationship. Uh, so um, that's, our, that's three questions that were submitted. Again, we'll not get through them all today, but let's start with this first one. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart. I think, it, again, I think it does tie in to the, the question of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Again, it was asked specifically if the two are similar, and, and I think maybe they are similar. Go back to the book of Exodus chapter 4. In verse 21. And this would probably be the only question that we look at today. We'll save the rest for next week. Uh, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1. You remember as the book of Exodus begins, there's an evil Pharaoh, one who did not know Joseph, chapter 1 and verse 8. And uh, that's when Moses is born. But then later in life, Moses is an adult man. There's a new Pharaoh and he's just as evil to the people of Israel, living in his land uh, as God had directed them under the hand of Joseph. So God sends Moses away after he kills the Egyptian uh, for 40 years. And then he, now, he, now keep, keep in mind, when Moses goes back to Egypt to lead the people out, he's 80 years old. I mean, he's, uh, you know, he, he and, and this is past the days of living to eight and 900 years. I mean, he did live a long life, of course. Um, he looked at Deuteronomy to get his exact death date or year. But, um, but yeah, he's 80 years old when he comes back. In Exodus chapter 4, in verse 21, The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And I've given some other examples. Chapter 7 and verse 3, chapter 9 and verse 12. 10, 1, and also verses 20 and 27, chapter 11, chapter 14, three times as well. So here are some examples in the book of Exodus where it says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, one thing that we must always remember when studying the Bible is to not come to a conclusion uh, based on one verse or even one passage or one chapter. We have to remember to always put the, the Bible together. Because you notice in chapter 8 and verse 15, in the book of Exodus, chapter 8 and verse 15, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 8 and verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. So you have examples. Uh, I've just given a few. There's actually many more. I didn't realize how many examples there were of it uh, saying people hardened their heart. But here are three in the book of Exodus, chapter 8, verse 15 and 32 and then 9 through 34. Um, and then also you see in 1 Samuel chapter 6 uh, where it talks about that of um, Pharaoh hardening his own heart. He's, uh, he's going against God. He, he, he's not open to God. He's not receptive to God. God is using Moses uh, to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh won't. So he brings a plague upon him and, and his nation of people. And, and instead of Pharaoh uh, uh, having an obedient heart, Pharaoh is, is fighting against, resisting God, fighting against God. Throughout these plagues. And it's not until after the tenth plague. The death of the firstborn. That he finally lets them go. But even that he quickly changes his mind. And he pursues the Israelites. Of course that's when they drown in the Red Sea. So you have examples in the Bible. Where it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But you also have in the same book. It says Pharaoh hardened his heart. His own heart. 
So is, is, there, is there a contradiction or is there a, a biblical conclusion that we can come to? So not only can we come to a conclusion by reading one verse and just also sometimes just the book or the chapter, but we have to consider everything else the Bible says about it as well. And some verses that I would consider in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 talks about God not being a respecter of persons. He's no respecter of persons. So you know, from the beginning to the end with Adam and Eve forward, and God has always allowed man and woman to make their own decisions whether or not they would follow him. So if the Lord hardened his heart to take that decision making out of Pharaoh, then we're going to have a problem with the rest of the Bible. When he kind of controls Pharaoh as a puppet where Pharaoh can uh, have no other choice in the matter. And that uh, would not be the case when you look at the Bible uh, as a whole. Uh, remember the Pharaoh of Genesis uh, chapter 12. Uh, even though he, uh, was, uh, he, 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 he still had his own decisions in the matter and uh, he was allowed to make his own decisions in the matter uh, even though this is right around the beginning of Abraham's time, of course. But uh, you see uh, he making his own decisions. Nebuchadnezzar is the same in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, you see Nebuchadnezzar making his own decisions in the matter. And the king of Nineveh, Jonah chapter 3 and verse 6, they, they repented. Uh, the whole nation repented. So God has always uh, given that in which... Uh, which we need, and then we make our decisions to obey or not. You see, something like Saul, like the king that we're talking about here, uh, you see him choosing to obey for a while and sometimes not. Sometimes the Bible does not give a definite answer, and it leads us to wonder what the final answer is. And sometimes there's not necessarily a final this answer. Sometimes you might have a number of conclusions that it could be, and that's just, that's just the way it is it's sometimes. Leaves your head spinning, I know. But remember that you can also cancel out what a conclusion cannot be. And I would use these verses and others to cancel out that God controlled Pharaoh to where Pharaoh was not, um, did not have the ability to make his own decisions. The same with Judas, of course. Uh, I can't remember if that's on the next slide or not. Uh, let me see. It is not. Uh, but remember with uh, Judas, it's just the same. Judas was an apostle of our Lord. He followed the Lord. Uh, but Judas chose to heart in his own heart. Okay. So I believe the, let me give you this quote by Clyde Woods. Uh, when Pharaoh chose to resist the will of God, each refusal of the signs only confirmed Pharaoh's stubbornness and made it easier to resist. God used Pharaoh's stubbornness in demonstrating his power. When it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, the same as what we're going to notice uh, with Saul next week and a number of other people, Nebuchadnezzar, as I mentioned, and these other people, I believe it was simply God's law, God's rule. And God is saying, this is what you must do. So I think that's God's interaction with the hardening of the heart. He placed the law. He placed uh, what they are to do. And then they choose to respond in faithful obedience or not, the people. And I think that's the case with Pharaoh. He chose, and that's what we must remember, in all 10 of the plagues, Pharaoh had a decision to make. If God hardened his heart to control him to where he could not make a decision, then, then why is it telling us that Pharaoh would not allow this to happen? And uh, so I, didn't, I thought we'd get a little more into it before the bell, I'm sorry, but we'll pick up here next week and that'll take us back into 1 Samuel with the distressing spirit of the Lord. But no, I, I do not think that uh, God controlled him and hardened his heart to where Pharaoh did not have a decision in the matter. I think it's just simply God's involvement, God's word. And the same is true today. God gives us his word and for some they obey it, for some they come hard to it and they say, no, I'm not going to do that. So that uh, might leave you hanging a little bit, but it might leave you with the appetite to study a little on your own. Again, those three questions that we'll look at uh, the hardening of his heart. Um, did they recognize each other? And then what was that relationship like? So that's our class for today. And we'll look forward to getting back together uh, at the top of the hour for worship. Thank you.